much. It's uh, it's really it's really great to be with you, and uh, it is sad not to be able to be in person. Uh, and for those of us who are on the teaching end of things, I know one of the great joys we get really is of going out to different communities, meeting you on your turf, uh, and really being able to experience the the human environment. You know, that's the larger context for all of this learning. But it is uh, it is a boon and something that's also a privilege to take advantage of for these kinds of connections to be able to be made uh, in this age of more remote learning. So, uh, to, uh, to Arya and everyone else, uh, to the sponsors this year, and just all of you for creating, uh, really this now extended community of learning, which is, uh, incredibly inspiring for those of us who care about Torah. And I count myself in that lot. I am coming to you from New York city, uh, the Northwest corner in Riverdale. And I serve as Rosh Yeshiva, uh, and president at Hadar. And uh, it's been a tremendous time of expansion for us uh, in this more virtual age of reaching out to people. So thanks for having me and really excited to lean into this topic, which I wish didn't feel current or critical, <laughs> um, but feels like it is very present and in some ways evergreen. Um, the question of how do we reckon with on a personal practical and communal level, what can be an intense disjuncture between the content that someone produces and our interest in it, our love of it, our sense maybe even of cultural dependence on it, and on the other hand, perhaps the human vessel in which it's contained, which might be that of a person with a rotten character. Uh, a destructive force in other ways, and how to find a way to navigate that. Um, so I'm going to put a question in the chat, I will say in general, for ground rules for the session. I welcome and encourage you uh, to process and ask questions in the chat throughout. I will be able to follow that kind of as we go in parallel form. Yeah, I got a comment, you're thinking something, put it in there. You got a question, put it in there. I'll pause periodically for us to engage, uh, but I do try to keep an eye on that and I'm able to do that as I teach. And I'm gonna start there and ask you a question here. Um, I'm gonna do this sort of as a, a poll where I wanna just uh, ask you to throw in a number based on a scale that I'm going to lay out here. So there it is in the chat. If zero represents moving swiftly to completely abandon the artistic products of anyone with a stained reputation, and five would represent a total separation of artists from their art, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Wagner was a Nazi, I love his operas. Uh, it doesn't matter if someone was a sexual abuser, if they wrote tremendous musical tunes the music lives independent of them. Where are your initial instincts on that scale? Okay, you don't even have to feel you would justify them. I'm really actually asking for your instincts. You might even feel uncomfortable with preaching those to others. Where are you on that scale? So three would be smack in the middle, basically, I guess technically 2.5, uh, where you just really feel torn in both directions. Um, being lower than that would be saying, no, we're going to have to really forego, you know, cultural, artistic, literary Torah products based on rotten characters. Uh, and on the other side, higher than two and a half, it's going to be trending more in that direction. All right, so let's see what we got here, just looking here. Uh, a great distribution. Fantastic. We got a whole bunch of threes. We got a bunch of fours and fives. I don't see any ones yet, but a couple of twos. Um, so this is a good range. I think very few people on the extreme. So we got a couple fives, um, at least one, and uh, you know, a sense of somewhere in the middle. All right, you can take another minute to fill that out if you're still thinking about it. But I think it's important to orient with any learning like this to kind of start with being in touch. Where am I starting? I'm gonna ask you to kind of be open to thinking about some of the messages that we're seeing in the text here. And I don't know if I'll formally ask you again at the end, but it's worth asking at the end of the learning, have you maybe moved to a different place? Or sometimes you're in the same place, but now you have vocabulary for talking about it. 
from within a rabbinic discourse. So this is a topic that in, you know, uh, in, in classical Hebrew, we might call rechavam miniyam, wider than the sea, uh, in terms of how much time you could spend on it or how much you could delve in. We're going to look at two passages from the Talmud, two primarily narrative passages, but I would say they are normative narrative passages uh, that give us a sense of real figures, real situations where this played out. But as is often the case, I think we might say always the case with Talmudic narrative, um, there are some marvelous and frustrating ambiguities. <laughs> And what we do with those ambiguities and how we unpack them and resolve them will ultimately give us a wide range of pathways. So spoiler alert, I'm not really gonna give you an answer to this question by the end. My goal is to give you A, perhaps a richer rabbinic vocabulary for talking about it, and B, a sense of how actually you could be accountable, you could hold yourself accountable to the rabbinic canon on this question and potentially come out with some very different answers. But my goal is that that doesn't lead to just the kind of nihilism of, well, you could say anything you want and justify any position you want, but that you're able to kind of take in the competing concerns that the texts are laying out. And even if you end up a five or a zero on this scale, being aware of what would put someone else on a different place of it, uh, I think is a self uh, something significant. So you've got a link there uh, if you want to go directly uh, and be in the document yourself. Um, I'm also going to share this page uh, so that you can uh, follow me if you prefer to do that. I've got the original here. And so if you want to follow along in the original Hebrew or Aramaic, uh, please do that by following through on the link. But I'm going to read off of uh, the translation and I'll refer back to some of the uh, key passages. All right, so you see here, right, some of the opening questions that I'm uh, pointing us towards, right, when, what do we do when a person with extraordinary gifts and talents lacks virtue and good character? And can we excuse those personal foibles in order to ac access a person's great wisdom or their effective leadership skills? What are the considerations? What are our standards? So we're going to start with a quite uh, provocative and I think uh, full of pathos story from the Talmud Bavli in Moed Katan, 17a. Uh, if you happen to be doing the Daf Yomi cycle, we're only about a week away uh, about from this passage. So if any of you is on that train in one way or another, uh, you will come across this shortly. So let's jump in. The story begins straight off. There was a certain Torah scholar who gained a bad reputation. All right. Question number one, when we come to some ambiguities, I'm going to just put them out there have you think about it, and then keep going with the story. Right? Question number one is, what does that mean, a bad reputation? What's the realm of behavior we're talking about? And is bad reputation a rumor? Or the person has a bad reputation because they were caught doing something, and they now have a bad reputation because you're worried it will repeat. Rav Yehuda as we'll see, one of the reigning scholars at the time. We're here in the second generation of Amoraim, so put it roughly in the second half of the third century of the Common Era. Uh, Rav Yehuda said, what should be done? To excommunicate him? The sages need him. Not to excommunicate him? The name of heaven would be desecrated. So we see here the certain Torah scholar whose anonymity might perhaps have made us think that he is not so significant, is quite significant. Rav Yehuda does not feel like he can easily excommunicate him, if you will, to translate to, uh, to uh, contemporary uh, discourse. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's so viable to fire this person. We need him. He's doing some very important work. The community will suffer if we can him. But on the other end, what are you going to do? Not hold him accountable? Not cut him off? The name of heaven will be desecrated. So right there, right? You've got the dilemma. We need him, and keeping him will profane what we stand for. Rabbi Yehuda said to Rabbi Barbar Khan, have you heard anything with regard to this? He said to him, Rabbi Yochanan said as follows, what is the meaning of that which is written? For the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek Torah at his mouth. 
for he is a messenger, a malach of the Lord of hosts. What does that verse mean? It's talking about a priest who has knowledge, is a repository of Torah. People are supposed to seek Torah from this priest who is kind of like a rabbi, right, in the context that we're talking about here. If the teacher is similar, and, and then, sorry, and then the verse adds, for he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. In the original, the formulation there is, ki malach Hashem tzvaotu, okay? I'm just putting this in the chat so you can see this. Ki malach Hashem tzvaotu, uh, which the plain sense of that would seem to be, for he is, seek Torah from him, because he is a messenger or an angel of God. What did Rabbi Yochanan say on this verse? Reading the word ki, not in its sense of because, but in its sense of while, or provided that, which is another meaning for that biblical connective word. He reads it as saying, this verse teaches, if the teacher is similar to an angel of the Lord, then seek Torah from his mouth. But if he is not, then do not seek Torah from his mouth. So Rabbi Bar Bar Chana quotes a tradition of Rabbi Yochanan that says, actually, this verse in the book of Malachi tells you that you only seek out the Torah of a teacher, provided that teacher is like an angel of God. Meaning the only Torah that is worthwhile to learn, or perhaps even that is permissible to learn, is one that emerges from a person who has a kind of divinely approved character. And the implication would then be, you have to get rid of this guy, right? This Torah scholar who you say, oh, we need him, he has such great Torah, his Torah is worthless if his character is shot. Based on that reading, back to the story, Rav Yehuda ostracized that Torah scholar. So that was it. That was the decision. He was cut off. He was, as it were, fired. He's not teaching in the community scholars program anymore. In the end, Rav Yehuda took ill. The sages came to inquire about his well-being, and the ostracized scholar came along with them as well. So now the ostracized scholar is paying a visit to Rabbi Yehuda on his deathbed. He's with the other people there. So he hasn't obviously been totally cut off. The excommunication degree, decree was probably not 100% successful. When Rabbi Yehuda saw him, that is to say that scholar, he laughed. Rabbi Yehuda laughed when he saw this person come in. The ostracized scholar said to him, was it not enough that you excommunicated me? But now you even laugh at me? Rav Yehuda said to him, I wasn't laughing at you. Rather, I'm happy, meaning I'm smiling, as I go to that other world that I did not flatter even a great man like you. So Rav Yehuda, until the end, holds the line against this scholar who we see now was a great man. Right? Rav Yehuda indicates this is someone with influence, perhaps with power, someone who had tremendous sway over his contemporaries. And Rav Yehuda is very proud of himself as he goes to the great beyond, that he did not capitulate to that social pressure, to that charisma, to any number of other things that made this person uh, a man of esteem. That is act A of the story. Now we get to the post-mortem of what happens after Rav Yehuda dies. The ostracized scholar came to the study hall and said to the sages, release me from the decree of ostracism. So his great antagonist, Rav Yehuda, has died. It's not clear if this is just a power play. This is an ambiguity. Is this showing how this guy is a bad guy? As soon as Rav Yehuda dies, he's trying to worm his way back in to rehabilitate himself. Or there's some notion that the excommunication was only supposed to be enforced for as long as Rav Yehuda was alive. So the sages said to him, there's no man here as eminent as Rav Yehuda who can release you. Rather, go to Rav Yehuda Nasi in Eretz Yisrael, the great figure of the land of Israel, the traditional redactor of the Mishnah, 
uh, the patriarch, Rabbi Yudah Nasi, he can release you. So that scholar, the ostracized man, came before Rabbi Yehuda Nasiya, the this, this man, another term for him. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi said to Rabbi Ami, go and examine his case. If it's necessary to release him, release him. So again, we see the dynamics of there's people who want to let him back in. The sages who he comes to don't want to take responsibility themselves, but they're encouraging go to this guy. And even Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, of great renown seems to be inclined to give the guy a shot, a second hearing. So go check it out. Rabbi Ami examined his case and thought at first to release him from his ostracism. But Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachmani rose up on his feet and said, if the maid servant in the house of Rabbi Uda Nasi once ostracized another person, he tells some story. And there was once a time where a woman working in Rabbi Yudan Nasi's house, the idea of someone of pretty low social authority, but she was in the house of a great rabbi. She once proclaimed a ban, an excommunication on a person, and the sages did not relate frivolously to her decree of ostracism, and they didn't revoke it until three years had passed. Well, all the more so with regard to a decree of ostracism placed by Yehuda, our colleague, the first Rabbi Yehuda at the beginning of the story who placed this ban. We must take it seriously and not release this scholar. And then Rabbi Zera, another sage there, pipes up and says, what caused this elder, Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachmani, to come before us in the study hall today? For many years he didn't show up, and now he comes exactly when we were talking about this? It must be a sign from God. Learn from this that there is no need to release this man from the ban. And so Rabbi Ami did not release him from the ostracism and the ostracized scholar left in tears. Okay, so there's an effort to undo it. There's repeated efforts to undo the ban, but there are these interventions in various ways that keep him held at bay. Now the final paragraph of the story and some significant ambiguities. A wasp came and stung the ostracized scholar on his ama and he died. We're going to come back to what the ama is, right? Um, but it is some part of the body. He is stung on the ama, and he died. They took him to the burial caves of the pious, but they, that seems to be the pious, did not accept him. They were unable to bury him. There. They took him into the burial caves of the judges, and they accepted him. What is the reason that he was accepted there or not accepted in the other place? What's the reason for how that played out? Because he acted in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Eli. As it is taught, Rabbi Eli says, if a person sees that his evil inclination is gaining control over him and he cannot overcome it, then he should go to a place where he is not known. He should wear black and he should wrap his head in black, do as his heart desires, and not desecrate the name of heaven in public. So at least according to this version of the Talmud, I'll come back to a variant in a couple minutes. According to this version of the Talmud, this guy, however bad he was, nonetheless followed this stricture of Rabbi Eli, which says something like, if you're going to commit a sin, at least don't do it in public and disgrace the community. Find a way to go off and do it in private you're going to sin one way or the other. At least don't drag the reputation of the broader community you're a part of down with you. And according to this version of the text, because this ostracized scholar, at least in his lifetime, obeyed that rule, he was ultimately taken into the burial caves of the judges, even though he was denied entry to the burial caves of the pious. Okay. That's our story. That's story number one. We're going to get to passage number two in a minute. So I want to ask here, um, right, some of the questions of, uh, that emerge from this and anything else that's come up for you in thinking about this story as a potential kind of guidepost for how we act in these situations. And again, please put things in the chat as they come up. What are some of the questions? So the first question I already highlighted before well, what did he do wrong? What do you think? 
right? There's a lot of actually tone of innuendo in this story. Um, what's your basis, right? I'd love to hear from people what you think the wrongdoing was that gave this scholar a bad reputation and whether he actually sinned or it was just a rumor, right? So that's question number one. Question number two, we've got this standard of similar to an angel of the Lord. That's the standard that you should be adhering to if you want to be treated as a teacher of Torah. What is that? What does that mean? Why did Rabbi Ami and all of the other people in the story that seem to keep pushing want to release him from the ostracism? Right? What's the motivation there? Why? What do you think the meaning of the word ama is, where the wasp stings him, and is that somehow a key to what happened? And then the statement of Rabbi Eli at the end, exactly its function, is another question. And on some level, the most important final question is, what do you think the conclusion is here? <laughs> if you were to try to cite this text as a normative proof text for, let's see what the Talmud says about whether we should learn from people uh, who have gone astray, well, what is the bottom line here? All right, so let me start with question one, just get a few reactions on that. What do you think he did wrong? What do people think? Throw, give me some, some things in the chat, uh, or if someone wants to uh, you know, do a, a Zoom hand raise, we can, uh, we can find you and unmute you. Um, what do you think? What's the sin here? It's not made explicit. So what do you think is implicit here, hinted at, in one way or the other as the, as the issue. And the reason this is important is not just for understanding the story properly, but in a way, if you assume the story holds the line on a certain standard of behavior, while actually understanding what that bar is based on what he did or didn't do becomes particularly critical, right? As we think about this in the contemporary world, um, it's not just an abstract question of, do I think people who have misbehaved should continue to hold a job, should continue to be in positions of religious leadership? Do I think people who have a bad character, should I enjoy their art or their Torah or their music? It's also, well, what's in the category of being such a big deal that I have to care about? So do we have any thoughts on what's happening here? All right, so one potential suggestion, we've got a few coming in. Uh, maybe it's a haughtiness, right? That is to say, it's really just a, uh, a kind of arrogance. Maybe part of this notion of he's very important, people appreciated him, that's kind of a key. Um, and in that sense, that would be a very high bar, right? Which is to say, even someone who is haughty in that way is not behaving like an angel of God, their Torah becomes worthless. Okay. Um, great. Another one that it's related maybe to speech. So not just thinking highly of himself, but maybe there's something about speaking for other people. Dennis, if you want to provide a follow-up comment, is there anything in the story you feel actually backs that up? Uh, is there something about the way he talks? Maybe there's a hint of the way he aggressively pursues his own release that indicates something that's aggressive in that way. Um, Great. Okay. Arya, I think, is pointing out now something important, which is going to loop back to the Ama question, as you say. He is stung and dies at the end. And that seems at least to be confirmation that he did something wrong, even if it underscores that that may not have been apparent to the protagonist in the story before that point, right? It can both be the case that from the human protagonist perspective, this may be a kind of rumor mill situation where they don't know what's going on. And then later, as it were, the papers come out, that you know, the diary is released or who knows what, um, but where the stinging happens. Now, the ama, I'll just jump in on this, right? What is the ambiguity around the ama? Well, an ama can mean a cubit, right? And so it can literally just mean his arm. He's still on his arm, happens to be on his arm. That's where it happened. Maybe it's in a place where people can see. Ama, however, can also be a euphemistic term for the male organ. And if that is what happened, it's almost certainly a suggestion that the sin in question was sexual. 
And in fact, the Tosafot, one of the commentators here, they say this was mida keneged mida. This was a direct proportionate payback. He sinned essentially with that part of his body. He dies uh, with a mark of Cain, a scarlet letter, as it were, on that part uh, of his body. But that suggests, right, through the use of uh, you know, resolving that ambiguity, perhaps the story is particularly severe because it is an offense specifically of a sexual nature. Maybe some of the other things we're talking about would not trigger this kind of opprobrium or fear of shaming heaven. Great, we have a bunch of other things, right? Ethical issues, not helping people in need, shaming, disrespectful, um, right? All of these different dimensions. Uh, we just answered that ama piece, all right? So that's a, a first piece there that's just really important, um, right? The Talmud either just really doesn't spell out what the sin was, or the entire key passage, right, is the stinging on the ama, which is meant to clarify for us what we were talking about in veiled terms because it was somewhat uncomfortable and maybe even inappropriate. All right, but now I want to loop back. Let's even, I mean, you can sort of assume whatever reading you want, but let's, let's go into the, the reading of sexual offense for a moment here. In our next passage, we'll see, we'll be talking about heresy and, uh, and things that are much more intellectual crimes. But here, let's assume there's some kind of either sexual offense or something we would uh, we would really comfortably call abuse, okay, in some kind of meaningful way, though it could also just be licentiousness on the sexual plane from a rabbinic perspective. What's the conclusion of the story? What do you think? <laughs> Is the conclusion of the story, yes, people like that have to be ostracized, and all the attempts to go to the contrary are undone, um, and therefore it's sort of shoring up that approach? Or does the end of the story with the acceptance into the burial caves of the judges somehow indicate, well, the person has to suffer, they have to pay a price, but at the right time with the right follow-up, there's some kind of rehabilitation. How, how do you read the story, right? This is really my question number six, <laughs> um, in some ways mixed with my question number three right? What are the motivations to release someone like this from ostracism? And are they ever well-placed according to the story? Is there a bar that you can clear or no? So I'd love some thoughts on that. Again, either in chat or you could do a Zoom hand raise. Uh, if I asked you to say, what's the conclusion? What, what, do you, what do you think? It's obviously a rich narrative. And on some level, any narrative like this that doesn't you know, summarize itself in one line, doesn't think the most important thing is to write the employee handbook about how to handle it. But I also don't think the story is totally agnostic. So I think we have to have some kind of reading uh, of what's happening here. All right, so some of the reactions, initial reactions here are coming in the form of questions, right? Like, can they be rehabilitated? Is redemption a possibility? Uh, so I'm not sure the exact tone, right? I, I'm reading that in one way as the tone of the standard for whether we can let them back in is can they be rehabilitated, right? That is a reading of the story, I think, where you could read the standard of being like an angel of God, not as a kind of one-time determination that then is what a person is for all time, but it may be you need to be in that state of being in order to be a teacher of Torah. Can a sinner who was not like an angel of God work their way back to becoming comparable to an angel of God? Perhaps. Maybe that's one of the messages of the sugya. It's a hard line, but to the extent there's been real redemption or real turning around, um, you should enable the person to become back, come back. Now, the more you're talking about a crime where there's a victim, the more there may be a sense of, well, as long as that person is broken in some way, there really is no pathway back. And that would be emphasizing on some level, I think, this aspect of the burial caves of the pious, don't let him in. One of the fascinating ways this gets adjudicated in later uh, Talmudic interpreters uh, of this passage is, what does it mean that they took him into the burial caves of the judges? 
And there's two readings of it, uh, which themselves kind of reflect, I think, opinions of judges. One is uh, to say, oh, the judges, they're, they're not like the absolute highest level of the pious, but these are solid people. And the fact that he's let in there shows that there's some kind of sentencing consideration as you were, uh, as it were, right? He follows some judgment with Rabbi Eli. He has some restraint of not doing certain things in public. Um, and, and he maybe had remorse. And so at a certain point, yeah, he's back into the burial caves of the judges. Maybe you're not going to, uh, you know, give him, as they say, Maftir Yonah and Yom Kippur. You're not going to give him the biggest, uh, the biggest honor <laughs> that the community has to offer, but you'll let the person back in. But other interpreters of that text say, what do you mean? Who are the judges here? The judges are judges who took bribes, meaning these are corrupt judges. He doesn't get buried with good people. He gets buried with the corrupt people. And in that sense, even in death, he's not let back in. And those, those versions tend to change the end of the story and say, he didn't even follow Rabbi Eli. This was someone who not only created harm for himself, but also defamed the entire community. But that itself raises perhaps a different standard. How much has this person not just made an error, but actually caused shame to whatever the larger uh, kind of communal complexes that they are a part of? So great. Other questions here about was there repentance and how effective can that potentially be? Um, and some of these other right questions of... Uh, <clears throat> of what it means to do these things in, in public and, and private. Um, and I see, right, also being raised here, you might rehabilitate someone as a person, but not as a rabbi or a teacher. Uh, that might be actually a very meaningful distinction. That is one of the theories in terms of people who cause harm in positions of leadership and power, uh, that the appropriate response um, is not to destroy their life, not to allow them no pathway to live, but to deny them the power that enabled them to commit that offense. So to the extent that we read into this story uh, that this man was a great man, perhaps it was some of that greatness that enabled or allowed him to make the errors he did, actually ostracizing him from that position of leadership or of teaching might be the only way to really be uh, kind of following that up. Okay, um, if you weren't already thinking about it, right, that story, I think, in a very direct way, um, brings up and starts to kind of push you to think about who are the figures that this calls to mind for you? Where are the contexts where you have felt this in your own community, looking in the newspapers? Recently in Israel, there was a really horrible, terrible scandal you may have followed about a very prolific author uh, of children's books, uh, very influential, particularly in the Haredi community, um, who was discovered to have been, uh, was, was accused of, and it seemed very, very strong evidence uh, of um, sexual abuse, assault, harassment um, in all kinds of contexts, including with children. Um, and this obviously shook the community of his readers uh, because he's writing books about children, et cetera. But it raised the larger question. Everyone agreed that these were, this was literature that was tremendously helpful for families, for parents to talk to their kids, engage with their kids about all kinds of challenging subjects. Did the books now have to be removed from the shelves? Right? I mean, this is directly, it's like ripped from the headlines about a month ago. And you can think about that. You can think about composers and music, questions that have come up about Karl Bach and his nigunim and whether using his music in synagogue sections is appropriate and the full range of possibility, right? On the one hand saying the music has nothing to do with the person who uh, right, was, uh, was writing it uh, or a middle ground that might say, you shouldn't do that in a context where you know there are victims or you know there are people who are sensitive to it um, or really all the way on the other extreme, no, the person's been tainted and you can't benefit from what they have. Certainly this sugya, this Talmudic story that we just read, leans towards the side of 
if the person is really been corrupted in a way that they are no longer like a malach Hashem Tzvaot, they are no longer like, in some plausible way, an angel of God, again, with all the ambiguity of where we draw that line, their Torah actually becomes worthless. We don't say the Torah is separate from the rabbi. Okay? But now we're going to turn to the Talmud Bavli in Chagiga, another story, which is going to seemingly take us in a very different direction. And the question is, why? Are these simply two narratives in conflict? Or is there a way of coming up with a rubric where we hold both of them in different contexts? So here we hear about the daughter of Acher, the kind of uh, maligning moniker of Rabbi Elisha ben Avuya. Elisha ben Avuya, who was a great scholar, the great teacher of Rabbi Meir. He is mentioned in Pirkei Avot, in the Mishnah, talking about how it's better to learn as a child uh, than when you, when you grow up, because it's just a lot easier to remember all the stuff you were learned as a kid. Like his words of Torah exist in the canon, but he is someone who the material in Chagiga tells us when encountering certain deep questions about God, ultimately became a heretic and threw everything away, rejected God, rejected the observance of Torah, uh, potentially even rejected the Jewish people. His daughter, after his death, came before Rabbi Yudan Nasi. Remember him from the first story, okay? Rabbi Yudan Nasi, the great sage in the land of Israel, and said to him, Rabbi, provide me with sustenance. Like, I'm poor. I'm in need. He said to her, whose daughter are you? She said to him, I'm the daughter of Acher. Um, whether that's the narrator swapping out her father's name, is possible, or it could be she even uses the term acher to indicate she buys in to kind of the rabbinic uh, excommunication of this person, right? Because the term acher means the other one, right? We're not even going to mention his name. It's the he who must not be named, uh, right? It's the Lord Voldemort for the Harry Potter fans of uh, rabbinic literature. He said to her, Rabbi Udanasi said to Elisha ben Abuya's daughter, is there still of his seed remaining in the world? Isn't it stated in a verse in Job referring to wicked heretics? He shall have neither son nor grandson among his people or any remaining in his dwellings. Meaning I'm amazed you're alive. I would have thought God would have wiped out the entire line of Elisha ben Avuya. She said to him, remember his Torah and don't remember his deeds. And this is not a guideline on our question. This is just a personal thing of saying, I'm poor, I need something. Can you give me something? Not because my father was a great guy, but because he was an incredible teacher of Torah when he was still in the game. Immediately fire descended and licked Rabbi Yehuda Nasi's bench. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi wept and said, if God protects the honor of those who treat the Torah with contempt in such a manner, how much more so would God do so for those who treat it with honor? Meaning the fire coming down from God is understood by Rabbi Yudan Nasi as a kind of rebuke of him that he was not going to take care of Acher's daughter, a rebuke of him not looking past Acher's character at the end in order to see his tremendous devotion to Torah at an earlier part of his timeline. And therefore says Rabbi Yudan Nasi, wow, I, I got this wrong. So that's part A of this passage. Something about the credit of Acher's Torah lives on at least sufficiently such that one should show his daughter favor. Right? Put aside whether his daughter should be judged by him and you help poor people who come to your door and all of that. But the framework of the story is an assumption where the daughter is actually just a conduit through which we are grappling with Elisha ben Avuya's legacy, okay? Now the Talmud kind of breaks the fifth wall of the story, the fourth wall, and turns, uh, maybe creates a fifth wall, and turns to us and says, and Rabbi Meir, how could he learn Torah from the mouth of Acher? Wait a minute. They ask themselves, they're like, we know Rabbi Meir was his student. How could he have learned from him? He was a total heretic. 
And the implication is, and we have stories to this effect, Rabbi Meir was in relationship with Elisha ben Avuya even after he abandoned God and Torah. How could Rabbi Meir have done that? And now look what they quote. Didn't Rabbi Barbar Chana say that Rabbi Yochanan said, what's the meaning of that which is written for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek Torah from his mouth for he's an angel of the Lord of hosts. If the rabbi is similar to an angel of the Lord of hosts, they should seek Torah from his mouth. But if not, they should not seek Torah from his mouth. Quoting our earlier passage, don't we have a standard whereby if someone is a rotten person, you have to abandon their Torah. Now note here, parenthetically, the crime here is not ethical, is not sexual, is not monetary. The crime here is intellectual and dogmatic. Right? There's no sense that Alicia ben Avuya is necessarily uh, a terrible person vis-a-vis -vis other people, right? Um, nonetheless, you see, this sugya is also quoting this. Like if there's a flaw in the, in the person, whatever it is, you can't just isolate the sheer. You can't just isolate the Torah nugget that you have extracted from them without paying attention to the full package. So how could Rabbi Meir have done that? So now we find efforts to reconcile this. Reish Lakish, a later sage, said, Rabbi Meir found a verse and he interpreted it homiletically. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge. So a verse in Mishle and Proverbs talking about seeking out wisdom, but pay attention to what happens. You're supposed to incline your ear, listen to the words of the wise, and what will you hear? My knowledge. It doesn't state to their knowledge, but to my knowledge. So what does Reish Lakish suggest? A very different model. When we think of a prophet speaking, we don't really think about the prophet saying what they say, we think of the prophet as being a conduit for the word of God. Reish Lakis is suggesting, Rabbi Meir found this verse and he said, this is how I think about Torah. I listen to the words of the wise, not because I care about them. It just happens to be that for whatever reason, some of God's wisdom has found its way to this world through the conduit of them. I don't really care about their character. I care about the words that they say. A verse that says you separate the artist from its art. That's what Reish Lakish says Rabbi Meir discovered. And Rav Hanina comes up with another uh, possibility that goes in a similar direction. So then the Talmud says, well, that's very nice that you've got the verbs in, verse in Proverbs, but you also have the verse in Malachi. So if so, the verses from Malachi and these other ones from Proverbs, and according to Rabbi Hanina, there's one in Psalms, they contradict each other. Meaning here we're saying, now we feel totally confused. All right, And this is where we are in our discussion. Now we feel totally confused, say the rabbis. On the one hand, the Moed Katan passage we were learning is centered around a verse in Malachi that seems to say there is no distinction between artist and art. There is no distinction between rabbi and Torah. To talk about Torah coming from an unworthy, worthy Torah coming from an unworthy source is an oxymoron because Torah only has worth if sitting atop a worthy individual who is speaking it. But then I have this other verse in Proverbs that apparently Rabbi Meir followed that says, yeah, they're just like a sock puppet for God. And just listen to that Torah and take it on its own. How can you resolve it? What do they say? This is not difficult. This case, Rabbi Meir, in which it's permitted to learn from a flawed scholar, is referring to an adult. Whereas that case, which prohibits doing so, is referring to a minor. Okay, now we got a whole different thing going on here. Now a new metric has been introduced where we say, you want to actually know how you make this determination? It's whether the person on the receiving end can handle it. Is the person on the receiving end able to make the distinction between the teaching and the teacher or not? 
And the basic paradigm here is a child will not, by default, be able to make that distinction. An adult will, by default, be able to. A child will see the teacher and the teaching, and if the teacher is rotten, will interpret and apply the teaching in the wrong way, or will lose faith in the whole system and throw everything out. Someone with more distance, with more sophistication, maybe with more cynicism, born of life experience, well, no, plenty of people are rotten and they have interesting things to say and they'll be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. This gets borne out by this following metaphor. When Rav Dimi came from Eretz Yisrael to Babylonia, he said, in Eretz Yisrael, they say, Rabbi Meir ate a half-ripe date and threw the peel away. That's the image. And then we get another image from Rava of a nut that falls in a pile of dung. But when you crack open the nut, the shell kept what was inside okay. And that there are situations of dung-covered shells of people that nonetheless contain tasty, healthy, and clean nuts of Torah. That's what Rabbi Meir was able to do. And then there's a final coda here at the end of the story, you can look at it your own, which imagines the final playing out of this uh, in heaven, in terms of God potentially affirming the notion that Rabbi Meir was justified uh, in making this kind of selective move. Okay, so you can still be in the document, but I'm gonna stop sharing here and I'd love to get some uh, kind of discussion here as we try to pull this together. Um, what's marvelous, I think, about these two stories is internal to each one, there is ambiguity. So there is a work in the first story that we did. What was the sin? What's the caves of the pious? What's the caves of the judges? Is there a way back? Is there not a way back? All of that is ambiguous. We've got in this passage that we just saw uh, a kind of explicit tension of two warring models, right? If I had asked Hagiga the question that I asked you at the beginning, right? Some of the voices there would be answering zero and some would be answering five, right? Right there on the page. And then an effort to introduce the question of reception um, as potentially being the barometer by which we make that decision. So each, right, there's complexity in each story. But then what is kind of fascinating and an incredible challenge to people who come later is, but how do I hold both of those stories together? Okay, think of it simply this way. If I were to ask you, what's the metric for decision-making in the second story with all the complexity, it seems to be an adult versus a child. Why is that axis completely absent from the first story. This is something that vexes later interpreters of these texts. Um, in particular, Maimonides, when Maimonides codifies the rules of an errant scholar, he doesn't introduce child or adult as an axis at all. He just says, if someone goes wayward, and they don't have the character of the angel of God, you can't learn from them. So then later interpreters, commentators on the Talmud, on the Rambam, on Maimonides, ask the following two questions. They say, number one, why didn't, why didn't Maimonides codify the child-adult distinction? And number two, we know Maimonides learned, this is in their language, from Aristotle and all kinds of other heretics. <laughs> Maimonides himself, who is codifying, if you will, a zero on my scale <laughs> of person's character, corrupt, God, you can't learn from them at all, doesn't give any nuance of adult child. He himself, we know, even talks about this, emet mimisha amara. you accept truth from whence it comes. When Maimonides is going through the calendar, he's like, here's the laws of the rabbinic calendar. 
Truth be told, the Greeks calculated the length of the solar year a little more precisely than we do, right? He's a, he's a man of, of science, of truth. You find the things that are true. You don't pay that much attention to where they come from. So, what, what gives? And they give um, some interesting and provocative um, and maybe even upsetting or troubling uh, responses. So one of these comes from the, uh, the Radbaz. Uh, a later commentator on the Rambam. Um, one really interesting response is to say, yes, indeed, the story in Moed Katan, that first story with Rav Yuda, with the anonymous scholar, involved children. That's why they took such a hard line. That's why they threw him out. That's why there was no way back for him actually very similar to the case I talked about recently in Israel. Um, you've got someone who's a scholar, great renown, great influence. The crime is then something that is sexual and the audience that is potentially involved are children. Total ban, books off the shelf, no way back. Had it not been that, had it been about whether adults could consume that person's content, indeed, it might have been a different story. Right? That's one suggestion. Second suggestion, kind of in some ways less, uh, um, more in keeping with the plain sense, but forcing us to kind of blow open the categories is uh, to say, no, no, no. The story in Moed Katan about the anonymous scholar is indeed totalizing. It was a ban, not just on this person teaching kids, but also teaching adults. And why? Because the sages determined that the people in that generation, even the adults were like kids. Meaning what? They were not able, they had a sense that people were not actually able to separate the artist from the art. And if the culture is such, adult and child are not actually important categories. Why does the Rambam leave it out? Maimonides doesn't codify that distinction according to this second explanation because he too assesses the average person is not actually able to do that. Who was able to do it? Rabbi Meir. And then says the Radbaz, and the reason Maimonides must have read Aristotle and all the things that he did was he knew that he could handle so he decided, I'm like Rabbi Meir, I will follow Rabbi Meir's model, but when I'm codifying law, when I'm creating policy, I'm not going to say that communal institutions should actually operate that way. If individuals determine that they're able to handle it, I'm not going to go heresy hunt them of what books they may read on their shelves, but if we're talking about what we put out there, what we show, what we share, uh, when there are reputational issues, uh, that should shut that down. Okay, so here we go. Should we still watch and enjoy Woody Allen movies? So putting aside whether the movies themselves, the content might be objectionable, right? That's what makes it, I think, a little trickier with something like Woody Allen. You might have aspects of it that you actually feel are wrapped up in the content there. Um, and I definitely would not say that Woody, Allen, Woody Allen's movies are Torah, right, for a direct hit on this. But sure, right, this notion, it's kind of also comedy, right, in all kinds of contexts. Are we accountable to that? Well, I don't know, Jake, what you say coming out from this material, right? I think part of what's interesting about that synthesis that I offered uh, of the two sugyot is there's this sense that maybe actually what the child-adult um, distinction is really getting at might be read as, can my culture handle it? Will the elevation of this person in fact lead to victimization of people? Will it in fact lead to the advancement of some of the things that they were standing for that I feel are harmful? Um, or no, people can need to handle it. Are, they, are the cases not all the same, right? Wherever you stand on cancel culture, and the question of does it exist and when is it necessary and what's the right thing to call it and all of that, it strikes me as reasonable that no matter where you stand on that, you would not think that all reputational offenses or stains are necessarily the same. 
and ideally, I think maybe these stories are pointing us to thinking about, well, what's, how, how are people going to be affected? Um, it goes back in a haunting way to that initial line in the first story, where Rav Yehuda initially says, I don't know if I, if I can excommunicate this guy. We need him. And in a way, the story undermines that, right? It's like, no, you don't really need anyone, right? The graveyards are full of indispensable people. But it doesn't mean it's not a real feeling of what's going to be the impact of having this person present or having them absent. That may be actually important. So, so I'm, I, I'm, I have the ability to unmute, so I figured I would just take it. So please feel like you have an audience here who's communicating with you. And Rabbi Linson, um, I think, points out something that I, I wrote as well, which is, could you differentiate that the first case is a, where a transgression between a person and another person? And it could be a sexual transgression. That's horrible. And it's, but it's, and the second is really talking about a transgression against God. And so what you're, you know, in the first one, you could say the Talmud is saying that you cannot come back from that. And the second one, you can, because between, when you're talking about education, as long as you can separate the person from the education, i.e. You're, you're an adult or you have nuance, then that's acceptable. And you can separate the artist from the art. Couldn't All right, good. So I, yeah, so I want to both build that up and explain the challenge of doing it. Uh, it's totally reasonable, right? That's a completely coherent rationale. I think it makes a lot of intuitive sense to us. Um, and in a way, sure, that could be a resolution. What's the main reason that that is not the obvious resolution that interpreters go to? Because both passages have the exact same drasha, the exact same exegesis from the verse about the teacher not being like an angel of God, which collapses on some level the, the distance between them and suggests, at least as a default, that there is no daylight between the two stories. Now, you can come back and say, this is the implicit daylight, right? Whether provided by the sugya or not, that's how we should read it. But to the extent that it hasn't been the obvious and only go-to answer, it's because people would say, well, the same objection is raised in both cases. And so that leads, I think, to the possibility that you would say, I don't know, it must be something else, right? Um, maybe we should have the adult-child distinction cross over the boundary. So it's not to, I, I, on some level, I agree with that. Like, I tend to find that um, compelling, right? The notion of, someone being shot down because of a dangerous idea that they had does feel more chilling and more limiting to me than someone being disqualified because of misconduct, right? But I think it's worth knowing, worth noting that this standard of, is the person like a malach Hashem tzvaot? Are they like an angel or messenger, right? Effective messenger of God um, seems to be applied, right? Across the board. So it's a great, it's a great question. And I think the potential ambiguity and resolving it is uh is very real um i, I would say uh, that yeah. i would say that if we keep the standard of, of of malach hashem we would have no teachers today that might be right i mean and that's where i think people also get are part of the drive to either raise the stakes on the crime in the moed katan story like to make it specifically a sexual offense or to soften the end of it by saying, well, you know, he was let into the cave of the judges is probably in response to that fear, right? Like if this isn't, when people, this was suggested at the beginning, right? In other words, maybe he was just haughty. I think that's right. I think if anyone who was haughty <laughs> ever, ever had, uh, in, you know, more than a modicum of ego thrown into their teaching uh, was considered to violate that standard, you probably wouldn't fill up the CSP for a full month, right? <laughs> With the range. And I think Rabbi Linson also brings up the second story is really about also a piece of it. I know it was the launching point for the discussion in, in the Talmud, but what do you do with a child of someone who has done something bad? Is that person going to be punished? And that's, that's a real world example because if you follow the Karlbach situation, Neshama Karlbach was being punished for what her dad may have done, you know, and lost her career for a while. Um, and, you know, so we have, that's, a, that's almost like a secondary issue that has to be um, addressed. 
That's right. And that's another way you could try to break it down. Again, it's, it's reading kind of off the page, which is the sense in which the second story is being lenient is actually not primarily about, you know, Alicia Ben Avuya. He's dead, right? So it's actually about his ideas and his offspring and whether he continues to taint them. And that, by the way, is another standard, right? You can imagine saying, this person's books cannot be on shelves while they're alive. That doesn't mean you burn them, right? It doesn't mean they never exist afterwards. Uh, that is one standard that some people have actually suggested. They're like, Karl Bachtun should go into uh, some kind of vault, right? I don't know how realistic this is, but some kind of vault until uh, any of his, uh, you know, alleged victims are no longer alive. Um, you can't you can't have it out there, right? When that is when that is live, but in principle, we allow for the notion uh, of that happening. You know, another way of of thinking about that. This is going to a different place, but how the passage of time can change things. Um, the notion of blaming the Holocaust on the sins of the Jews of Europe. Right, is something that for myself as grandchild of survivors, that was always to me like that was like one of the ultimate heresies, right? That like how, how could you ever say only people who are horrible would say something like that? And I remember at one point asking my father, I was like, but we all the time say we were exiled from our land because of our sins. And his answer to me was very helpful. He said, Yeah, but none of those people are alive. Like you couldn't say that to them while people are with their suitcases having been thrown out by the Romans, like that would have been totally inappropriate. And you don't know what will we say maybe in a thousand years, but at that point you're essentially having a narrative that operates on a much larger sweep of history than with the people in front of you. So a kind of victim and trauma informed response uh, to these questions may in a certain way be simultaneously more severe and also more circumscribed. Um, and that's another aspect here I think is worth, is worth thinking about. Yeah. Well, I know we're basically at time here. I'm always happy to stick around and chat if people want to do that. But I want to thank you really for going into this. As I said, my goal is not to bring you answers, but to bring you what I think are very intricate and very provocative two Talmudic passages that I hope can really kind of enrich your lexicon here for thinking about this. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you can email me. I can send you some additional sources where you can see some of the follow-up here. Uh, I think there are, there are answers in the plural to be generated out of this material that can help us minimally be much more thoughtful about these questions. Thank you so much for teaching and on a very relevant topic, as you mentioned to today in many respects. Some of the people we mentioned, some we didn't. Thank you, everybody, for being respectful and not mentioning someone else in our group today in this category. So that was very nice of you. And um, it would be, what would be kind of cool is to see how this has played out in some of the particular issues we talked about. Um, and if, 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 you know, taking maybe Karl Bach as an example, it'd be nice, interesting to see how traditional um, communities um, or communities committed to Talmudic, you know, discussion have addressed this issue. And see, I mean, because I know that they have and they've come out in different ways. So that'd be kind of interesting for us. And if you could share that, that'd be great. So thank you so much. And I wanted to thank all of you for uh, staying uh, up late with us here. Most of you from California. So you're not too late. Maybe late for a Hoover, I don't know. But the rest of us, it's not that late. It's six o'clock. My kids are calling. So I have to go home and have dinner with them. Thank you, Rabbi Tucker, for staying up late on your side in New York. We look forward to learning with you again. We appreciate all of that you've done in building, creating and building Hadar and sharing your faculty with us uh, this month. And again, I hope we can learn with you again in the future. Thank you, everybody. Take care and early Shabbat Shalom. Bye.